Hey budding lawyers, welcome to the podcast. Today we have Mr. Tarun with us. So, hi Tarun. Hi, Prasanna, how are you? Great. And I like uh talking to uh, you know young lawyers uh and you are also a professor. So, l- let yeah. me introduce like Tarun is an assistant professor at Gujarat National Law University with 4 years of experience in research and teaching. He pursued an LLM in constitutional and administrative law from GNLU and is currently pursuing an LLM in sports law and practice from D Montfort University United Kingdom. So uh first uh, let me start with something about sports. Uh, do you have any background in sports uh, which one do you like the most and why? Uh absolutely first of all Prasanna thank you for having me. Uh and you know it's great that you started a question with sports uh you know a lot of things about me have just come in uh, inside me because of sports and if you're asking me a particular sport that i like i've played a number of them i was very lucky uh, you know i come from dehradun where the sports culture is extremely extremely uh, uh, you know sophisticated and everybody loves to play uh, so a, a particular sport if you're asking me is going to be football i played a little bit of it Uh, at the university level when i was in jamia where i did my initial degree in law and then when i came to gnlu as well so i was a goalkeeper and the good part is that you know i'm wearing a gnlu jersey which i had uh, while i was playing for gnlu uh, so football is one sport but i've played cricket uh, basketball swimming i've done a lot of swimming when i was in school uh, so yeah uh, so the sum total about me uh, i think the first thing that i want to put at the top is that i i love to play So, which one is the most uh, like? Like you like the football, most football? Football, football is the football is the one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, like I know a little bit of it. Like, what was the position you played? Like, and you were in the front or defender? No, or... no, I was a goalkeeper. I was always a goalkeeper. A position which everybody undermines, <laughs> thinking that you know we don't have we don't have to do a lot of things. but a lot of things when the game is going on but i think it's one of the toughest job to do because the diving and getting back up again and you know keeping a track of the whole game i think it's one of the toughest jobs but i think but it's undermined everywhere so it's okay we the goalkeepers have started you know accepting that and they just do the what they want to yeah no i don't know about that but as if she is saying that it may be undermined but it is one of the toughest job that i agree because especially when uh most of the players are in that d inside the d like yeah. that is very crucial yeah i haven't played for years football now but i would love to someday let's see how it works yeah yeah so uh, tell us about the wor- kind of work you handle every day uh, also were you ever interested in pursuing an academic career interesting uh, you know so when i was in college uh, even in school for that matter i i will not say that you know i always had a love for teaching but i always you know was into teaching when i was in school when i was in college specifically in school and jamia before exams you know how we study uh, you know a one night before everything starts and you divide units among yourself so whenever i had the opportunity to teach what i had prepared for everybody i always found joy in that and a lot of people told me as well that this is something that you like doing is what we think so maybe you can think of taking it as a career i i never took that very seriously uh so when i finished jamia i started again uh, working in the supreme court uh, with the senior advocate very briefly that it wasn't a job job kind of thing but yeah i i got an opportunity to learn things uh, you know the result for clat came in and i got through gnlu and i switched so when i came to gnlu actually talking to a lot of people and you know looking at my professors who were teaching me I, you know that passion came into uh, you know came into being and i thought that this is something that i really really want to do uh, my initial plan was to do go into litigation uh, but i think teaching superseded everything and here i am you know max you know, i'm i'm a, I, i'm proud to say that i'm a young assistant professor who got an opportunity to teach in a great university of the country yeah so if you would have chose Uh, litigation then in which area would you have liked to practice a uh, criminal maybe not very sure though but let's you know for everybody who loves corporate law i have no i'll be very honest with you i have no passion for it i find that subject not very close to me so a corporate job or you know corporate litigation was something that i would have been really bad 
So I never went in that area. So criminal, majorly civil was something that I used to like. But the corporate part of it, I think, even in sports law nowadays, when a lot of people come to me talking about the corporate aspects of sports law, I tell them that give me a couple of days, let me read up on it and come back to you because I don't know, I never got connected to that subject till now. Not a very good thing because you should know basics of everything. But yeah, I'll be honest that I don't. Yeah, I know. And it's <laughs> because uh, corporate is quite hyped be- only because uh, it pays more. <laughs> so that is the only thing I think. I, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's, I, I, I just couldn't connect with the subject initially. Now I know a lot of, not a lot of it, of course, but the basics of it. But yeah. If you still ask me my preferences, it's going to be more into constitution and human rights aspect rather than the corporate side of anything. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you like the most about your job currently, whatever you are doing? Yeah. So I'm teaching. Uh, so yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, think the best part I know about... that you're teaching. Yeah, yeah. Means because uh, you have <laughs> yeah. some other projects too running. So that's why I put it. Yeah. yeah. All of them are yeah. So, so with teaching, uh, I think the best part about the job is, or I'll say, which a lot of, I think, uh, teachers will uh, agree to. I think the two things that are there, number one is it keeps you young. So teaching is something that has always kept me young. A major reason why I teach is that because of the reason that you stay around young minds, you get to know their perspective. And that's a huge learning. Uh, a lot of people undermine that fact that you know you can't learn maybe from students but I think the best source while you're teaching is student learning if you understand their perspective I think it's going to help you go really uh, you know high in your teaching uh, department which is very very important that is one number two because there are fresh perspectives you know students generally I think human being generally is you know a little conflicting it helps you to control your ego. It really works on that because you have to understand the person that you are communicating on, communicating with on a daily basis is somebody who's there to learn, uh, who, when you will start teaching them, will have a counter, counter argument uh, to everything. Uh, but you have to control yourself. You have to keep one thing in mind that everybody you know, there is, you know, who is in front of you is, wants to learn. And you can't you know, be egoistic about the fact that you know better than them. I will raise my hand very, very proudly and say that most of the things that I've learned while I'm teaching now is something that I've learned from students. Most of it, like the 80-90% of it is absolutely because of students, because of their fresh perspective, because they questioned me when maybe I was wrong or maybe when I had limited knowledge about something and that really helped me. So the best part is the student time, time that I have in the class, outside the class. I play football with them every day. So, you know, our conversations there, it really, really shapes me up. That is really nice. And being so open uh, with students, especially, it, I, you know, uh, kind of envy because I didn't have uh, such lecturers in my college. <laughs> okay. Uh, people have that perspective. I know a lot of people say that you should keep a distance with students and I maintain that distance. It's absolutely important to do that. But who are you teaching at the end of the, You're teaching the students. If you don't get to their level in terms of understanding, not anything else, but in terms of understanding, if you don't do that, I think somewhere it's a bit of failure, you know, that you, you're not ex- appreciating their presence is what I feel. Yeah. And, you know, you can be with them and also maintain the distance. No. So if you can, yeah, exactly. If you can do that, then. Okay. Uh, So you teach sports law. So can you all, can you just tell us uh, our listeners in brief, what does it involve? uh, What does it include sports law as a domain? And uh, like, can you explain it in detail? Yeah. Uh, This question comes to me whenever I'm giving an interview or whenever I, (laughs) you know, tell a layman uh, who doesn't understand sports law. Uh, so, you know, I just give them an example saying that if you imagine a, a, a tournament that happens, you know, maybe not a, even a tournament, you just look out of the window and there are people playing, you know, generally you find people playing cricket or football or whatever, uh, you know, around your vicinity. And you just think that what kind of issues can happen while that small match is going on. There can be issues of people fighting, right? So, you know, uh, there can be issues of uh, injuries. There can be issues... Uh, if you go to a little professional level, there can be issues of doping as well. People coming in and using banned substances. Mm-hmm. So anything that, uh, you know, legally, uh, 
regulates a particular tournament you know these can be issues of doping these can be issues of uh, match fixing corruption in sports in is including in sports law so sports law was wasn't as you know a, a, an individual field per se it's an amalgamation of a lot of things so labor laws come into play uh, criminal law comes into play ipr now comes into play you know with image rights and all of this is coming on so it's an amalgamation of all the laws that you study in your law school or anything that governs us uh, in terms of legal, anything that administratively or legally governs us is a part of sports law okay okay can you uh, give some kind of example or, or something which you are working on or you have worked on to understand it better uh, uh so for example let, let, let's just take you know a current uh, project that i'm working hmm. on so uh, you know i'm working on for the government of gujarat i'm working on a project which is about athlete legal education program so what happens is that uh, a lot of athletes in our country specifically at the grassroots level and at the state level are clueless and when i use the word clueless i mean it they're clueless about their legal rights and responsibilities and that is the reason why when they go to a professional level uh they 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 break uh, or they do things which are not uh, expected out of them uh and that is what we are trying to do so we are creating a module i've got a team of four five people with me so we are creating a module wherein we are telling state level and grassroots athletes that what uh you know you should keep in mind while you sign a contract for example if there is a you know contract coming into play uh we want to tell them that what are these doping norms and if you don't do you know take care of these doping norms what can happen to your career age fraud i think is one of the biggest problems this country has where a lot of athletes or a lot of you know their peers tell them to you know change their age and again play a particular tournament and now what are the legal uh, you know uh, sanctions that you can get if you do some that kind of thing uh, you know you're telling your age wrong or you're doing other corrupt practices in sports so uh this module is a compilation of all these regulations that can you know legal regulation administrative problems if you want to appeal to about something you know th- there has been a disciplinary committee against you you want to appeal to a higher committee or to a higher court how can you go about it so this is what i'm currently doing it's a, it's a module on athlete legal education program specifically for the state of gujarat but after this project i'm going to uh, make sure that i take it to you know a national level and maybe other states can use it a lot of i've not seen people doing this uh, uh, there have been a lot of intentions of people coming up and want to work with the athletes uh, about their legal education very few people do it uh, and i would you know put my bit in in this pro- through this project okay so you were talking about some disciplinary committee uh, from what i know we don't have some separate hierarchy uh, for uh, matters related to these uh, this sector but uh, i would like to know from you is there any separate court hierarchy like forums or like board no the court hierarchy you know you don't have a, of course there is court for a court of arbitration for sports which is for professional sports as soon as you go higher higher up the ladder it's in laws and switzerland so that is a specific arbitration you know court for sports but internally it's majorly about your domestic courts coming into play uh, internal committees for example you know you have a you you've got the aiff or you've got the ic uh, bcci they've got their internal committees to take care of things and if you are not okay with their uh, decisions and their awards uh, you know then you can go to a court you know get the redress from there uh, internationally as i've already mentioned there is court for, court of arbitration for sports which was a great move when it happened but at the but you can take all of this so you can you know uh, how should i put it take the services of all of this and get yourself redressed only when you know i'm not saying in depth knowledge of it but a basic knowledge of all of this and through this project this athlete legal education program uh, module that we are creating this is exactly what we are trying to do hmm. great yeah okay now <laughs> even this question must be you know kind of common to you uh, so why did you choose uh, sports law and how did your interest develop in this field i think it will again it was majorly about Uh, it was majorly because of the reason that i used to play uh, and i was v- i'm very very passionate about it watching so mo- if you check my youtube history it will be full of watching you know best goals best catches best baseball shots best home runs so on and so on and so forth and i love doing that it's a great past time for me so uh, when i was studying uh, uh, and this sports law i wrote a paper way back in 2011 12 if i'm not if i'm not wrong and that came from one of my seniors almost a decade ago 
Th- thank you for reminding me of my age, Prasanna. Thank you very much. Yeah, very special I feel because of that. Yeah, almost a decade ago. So she came up to me uh, and I want to thank her. She came up to me saying that, let's write a paper on sports. So there is this conference coming in and I had no clue about it. It wasn't doping if I don't, yeah, it wasn't doping if I'm not wrong. So uh, we wrote that paper and after that for a couple of years or three, good two, three years, I had no clue about it again. Then when I came to GNLU actually, and I will give a lot of credit to this place, uh, they had a sep- they ha- we have a separate center for sports and entertainment law. I'm a part of it. So they used to do a lot of programs and a lot of uh, uh, capacity building programs, research and all. Uh, I did not do anything ab- apart from one program when I was studying here. I did I did one uh, quiz and essay, uh, debate competition there. Uh, but you know it always attracted me because I used to play and I thought that if there is a separate law which is going to which which is which governs sport. And I love sports. Why not just put them together and see how it functions? And then, you know, I, I just, I didn't, I, I never looked back. And I think I love it. The, the, the area, it's a niche area, of course, I know. It's going to take a lot of time to uh, develop. It's developing. That's a great part of it. And I'm glad that I'm a part of that development process. Yeah. And it's, it is going to develop more for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but as you said, sports law is uh, quite a new domain in India. Uh, so if one is interested to start his practice in sports law, uh, what will you suggest? How should they plan? Uh, I think the first thing, Prasanna, which I want to tell everybody, uh, especially you know, young sports law enthusiast, this was something that was told to me by Amrut Joshi, one of the celebrated lawyers of the country um, in, in the area of sports law. Uh, Amrut uh, told me that uh, you know, people have a wrong perception that, you know, you can pick up a sports law book and you just read it through and you'll understand what sports law is. It doesn't work that way. It's extremely, extremely important because I mentioned it earlier as well, that it's an amalgamation of a lot of laws. It's extremely important that the basics of other laws, whether it's labor law, contract law, uh, you know, human rights, you should know those basics. So what I'll tell everybody who's, who's going to watch this video uh, is that, if you want to be a good sports lawyer, whether you want to teach it, you want to practice it, uh, or you want to be a sports policy maker, it's extremely important that you have a good command over the basics of every law that is taught to you in a law school. So do that. And then you can make a better connect with how you know it's going to work in the domain of sports, whether it's contracts, as I mentioned, or any law for that matter. And then, you know, there are a number of books domestically and internationally, um, Right now, when you know I've placed my phone, the all the books that are behind the phone to give it support are all sports law books. So it's great, right? <laughs> uh, so you know, domestically, Justice Mukul Mudgal with Vidushpat Singhani has written an extremely good book called Law and Sports. Once it's a must read to understand the uh, domestic uh, and the international uh, sports law circuit and sports policy circuit. There's one book by Simon Gardner. Uh, there are a number of journals that come out. Acer Academy is one academy in Netherlands, which works in the area of sports, um, uh, law and policy. Then you have law in sports. People who uh, are into sports law, they know about it. Visit that. You can, you can, you can, you can get uh, a small, you can get yourself registered there. Read articles there. You know, you get global uh, perspectives about a particular topic. So these are areas and reading and then writing about it. A, a lot of people, what I did initially, I used to read a lot of things, but I never used to put my ideas on paper. Uh, never do that. You know, when you read something, whether you write a 500 piece or, you know, word, uh, w- word piece or you write a 200 word piece, just write it because it helps you two ways. Number one, it helps you in, you know, putting up your arguments and what you think about, per- per- you know, about a particular thing. And secondly, it, get, it you know, it might bring a fresh perspective to something which a lot of people don't know because you can have a different idea about something. So it's extremely important for your own development and the development of sports community in general. So reading, writing. And getting, uh, you know, the basics of all the laws that you study in a law school are three things that I tell every young sports law enthusiast. Hmm. I think these are uh, quite common tips which are being given uh, who want to specialize in a particular area, whichever area it is. Yeah. 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 And and writing is something which is quite uh, maybe ignored by many law students, including exactly. me. Yeah, I will say, for, forget about law students. I'm, you know, I teach them. Who am I? Why should I blame them? When some, like a person like me, now I started writing. And again, I want to 
give a lot of credit of course to you know people who taught me uh, research writing and all but but to a lot of people who work with me you know students specifically because students write brilliantly nowadays i can speak of this generation because i you know i teach them they, you know the kind of people and the kind of writings that i've seen written by students nowadays uh, it's a joy to read it it you know it i you know whenever i read them i when i close that paper or close that particular chapter which they've written i just say to myself how stupid i am that i did not understand it when i was a student so it's 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 an inspiration to read what people are reading uh, writing now it is great so one should absolutely do it okay so th- this is the plan one must you know in general follow how to if if they are interested to build their practice in this field but uh, can you tell us about the clientele they can build like who fo- forms their clientele usually and like many from our audience would be interested in having a career here uh, yeah. so representing uh, like celebrity sports stars and what would be your advice to them uh, look first of all i'm not from that area i don't practice sports yeah, yeah. law but still you know whatever i've seen and whatever i've been in contact uh, with a lot of sports lawyer of the countries you know recently i got the opportunity which was 20th of jan very recently i got the opportunity to have richard mclaren anybody who loves sports law or knows about sports law professor richard mclaren is the person who was had an independent investigation committee uh, when the russian doping started happening the state uh, sponsored russian doping uh, scandal happened so the mclaren report is on his name so uh, i was i will say that i was i'm very lucky to have such kind of people around me that i can always go up to and ask them and you know do, in, you know domestic lawyers as well whether it's vidush pat singhania nandan kamath ana mehrotra young lawyers uh, you know like deep ray uh, rashi and all you know these people so that you know i am glad that i have such kind of company around me and when i ask them this question that what kind of clientele you have of course you know general cl- clients will be people, an athlete an art sports administrator you know even organizations that work for sports that's that that's your general uh, uh, you know these are the general clients that you have in india specifically i'm not very sure how internationally it has evolved or what kind of other things come into play but generally athletes are going to be or a coach maybe or an administ- sports administrator or governing bodies are going to be your clients so uh, uh, you are not practicing but uh, when you ha- uh, have such conversations with fellow sports lawyers then can you uh, tell us what challenges uh, do these sports lawyers usually face uh, number one of course is uh, that not every, if you know first of all right now in this country you know you know majorly if you look at any sports uh, law firm that is working here uh, these firms are not specifically sports concentrated and it's a little impossible to survive also right now if you only have sports law clients you can have a department which works in that area um, i'm i you know i salute people who are specific sports lawyers i know a few young people who are doing that who just take sports matter so i have all power to them and i'm you know best of luck to them uh, but the challenges that they face number one is of course you know the 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 i won't say a poor uh, environment but i will say a very limited environment for them to work because of the reason that you people don't haven't started taking this thing very seriously till now they might just take it so that's one challenge you know uh, you know the client base uh, uh, so to say is very limited that is one uh, number two is that when you work with a particular department or particular client who doesn't understand maybe the nitty gritties because you know they don't understand how the law functions in a particular jurisdiction that also i i think so becomes a challenge you know to make them understand that a b c d cannot be done and b c d can be done so you know these two challenges majorly is what i think limited client base and when you have that client base making them understand their rights and responsibilities specifically responsibilities and duties becomes a problem for sure yeah agree what were the noteworthy things uh, you came across while you started exploring sports law as a domain in india the uh, number one which i've already mentioned is that athletes unfortunately in this country specifically on the grassroots level even to the professional level i i haven't got an opportunity to work with the professional athlete but i i've taught uh, you know grassroots level and state level athletes number one is of course their limited knowledge or i would not say limited knowledge there is no knowledge about particular legal aspects their rights and responsibilities an extreme extreme problem that is one uh, the good part the flip side of it is that uh, surprisingly uh, they actually want to learn it 
so that gives me a lot of hope that when i went and taught them and they got so excited about it and they were like that please do come again sir we really want to understand this they actually gave me topics that why don't you speak on this next time so that gives me a lot of hope you know that athletes want to learn it so i think people like me i'm i'm too small right now i just started my career but this is something that i want to tell people who have been in the business for quite some time now and who want to be in the business now that the 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 athletes and the administrators uh, especially at the grassroots level want to learn a lot of lot of things they want to understand how the domain functions so it's our responsibility now to reach out to them because they they are not going to reach out to you because of a lot of uh, uh, i think restrictions or a lot of limitations maybe but we have you know that capacity to go and reach out to them at whatever level we can and help them out so majorly you know if you ask me uh, i i actually get very carried away when i start talking about athletes and their rights and i forget <laughs> the question but yeah if your question was that what are the challenges uh, you know or what what is the note noteworthy things one should keep in mind this is one thing that i want to tell them that reach out to the athletes that are actually looking for help hmm yeah okay okay so uh, you are pursuing llm from de montfort university united kingdom yeah. in sports law yeah. as we said before can you tell us about the course and anything you would like to highlight about it i think the best part for a person like me uh, and i think de montfort is helping me in that is it's a distance learning program so i can work and i can do that course it becomes a little challenging and very hectic because you know you have to take your own classes you have to do your own research and then you have to study and you know do your assignments it's a very hectic job uh but i think that model that distance learning model is absolutely brilliant and i had my apprehensions about it i'll be very honest and thanks to vidushpat sindania who comes from the same university i called him one day saying that so you know vidushpat sir i have these apprehensions will a distance learning program be okay and then he asked me a counter question that why i wanted be okay you give me reasons for not you know for saying that it's not okay so i like sir i'm not there the exposure doesn't happen so it's like you can always go there and you know you go to the university whenever you want to unfortunately covid happened so i couldn't travel but i had plans to go in may and then in november again but uh, the restrictions were there uh, so it's like if you want to get that kind of exposure you can already you know you can do it whenever you want to go there take a few lectures there they're never going to stop you so anybody who is in apprehension uh, you know about the distance learning program thing i should i think you should not have that kind of apprehension at apprehension at all and anybody who wants to continue working and studying i think this is the best model i won't say it's very cheap or something it's a bit expensive but of course like an international llm if you go there it's 50% of that or maybe less than 50% in some cases uh, so you know economically and the viability and the results that you're getting after that or the uh, you know the degree that you're getting after that i think is great so in all on all these three parameters economic the reliability of it and the end result of it i think it qualifies for me so it's great hmm yeah so also this is the second masters you are doing so uh, do you think this dual masters in law helps you in your work profile in any way Uh, it's a very uh, personal call prasanna i think it, it depends on your how you take it or what's your perspective on it i did not do it because i wanted to do look good you know i i wanted to look good on my cv saying that i'm a double masters it it sounds nice i think that you you're too you know your <laughs> double masters people think that your marketability goes really up i did not do it for that i did it purely because of the reason that i have a huge passion for sports law uh, in the area of sports law of course it gives you a bit of not a bit but it gives you a good push because people say that you've you know you've done a specific degree in the area of sports law so i want maybe if i want to pursue a phd it will give a good push to me uh, because i've got a specific degree now in sports law but it's a very personal call if you want to do it i did it because uh, i never thought of it when i when, while i finished when i finished my llb but now i think students have become extremely smart so if they want to do sports law i think after their graduation for their post grad they straight away go to sports law so for me it was a yeah. very personal call hmm 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 okay you are also a member of a uh, board of advisors of a number of sports law initiatives yeah. uh, tell us a bit about them 
so majorly you know either i'm a reviewer uh, for a particular sports law blog or on the board of advisors uh, and that to right now uh, domestically no international assignment i have per se and it's 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 a joy to be a part of these initiatives because the kind of work that i receive you know if, whether it's a blog written by a particular student or whoever has written it to read and to you know understand ideas it's a very very fruitful thing number one number two because of these things you get connected to sports lawyers and sports policy makers and that's even better because of the reason that you you know you understand the, most of the people that i've met uh, in the area of sports law has only happened because i'm a part of these student initiatives these are specifically student initiatives most of them are and mm. uh, you know I, i reached out to a lot of people and i met a lot of people who are sports lawyer and policy makers because of these initiatives so i want to thank these initiatives it helps me bo- in both the ways it, it helps me in my teaching and research because you understand new ideas and you understand teaching patterns and research patterns number 2 it helps you in a lot of uh, you know contact building and uh, you know uh, professional development so it's great yeah okay okay uh, so up to our last question uh, please share an incident from your career which is very memorable to you career up uh, you know there have been two three things actually can i i can i explain those two three things i can i cover those two three sure 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 yeah. <laughs> so can. one is specifically you know which is not a career thing but uh, i am glad it happened to me and that is sports in general like playing sport is something that i you know i think has been a blessing to me uh, it's great that i started i'm very happy that my parents pushed me i i i used to stay in a campus and anybody who stays on a campus understands that how easy uh, it was very easy for me to you know go find kids of my age and play with them and so that is one thing that so the general playing that that i you know voluntarily took a call that i want to play all my life and i'm still continue to do that i think that's one of the highlights of my life forget about career career i think one will be that i took Uh, you know made this gamble and uh, you know i'll i'll give a f- little bit of credit to myself that i you know i pushed myself in the area of sports law that because it was a niche area i had my own apprehensions that if people are going to respond well or people will be interested in me, you know in this area i'm glad i did it of course it's a little bit challenge not a little bit it's very challenging but i'm glad that i took it now it's becoming better so i'm a, as i mentioned earlier i'm a part of the evolution so it's a great thing uh but one of the most important things that happened to me i think is my first teaching assignment in the area of sports law uh, i want to thank one of the universities in uh, gujarat itself uh, one of my early uh, senior colleagues who was with us in gnlu went to that university and he was the first one who gave me an opportunity to teach so i thank him uh, for giving me that opportunity and my first class which i had i was terribly terribly scared i did not know anything up in terms of how it's going to go but it went really well and it gave me a lot of boost and then i went to other universities like symbiosis um i went to uh, uh, amity once and you know nirma university here uh, a number of uh, you know student uh, you know not in not student initiatives i've taught in but now i'm going to uh, do that so these three things playing sport taking you know uh, playing this gamble and being into sports law and my first teaching assignment are my you know are my life changing experience and i'm glad that, glad that they happened okay yeah. uh, thanks tarun for the informative conversation thanks yeah and thank you all for listening to this podcast if you like this episode then you must also check out our other episodes available here and follow us here so that you don't miss out a new episode thank you